Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Caleb and this is your guide on C strings. These are available in both the C programming language and the C++ programming language. When you're working in C, you'll probably just call them strings, but when you're working in C++, you often call them C style strings because there's actually two ways of working with strings in C++. The first being the C style and the other being the string class, which I think is generally recommended, but it's probably good to know how C strings work as well. Two things I wanted to mention before we get started. The first is that I'm actually preparing a C slash C++ master course. So if you want to get notified of the updates for that, check out the link down below. That'll get you added to my newsletter, which will get you any new information on new content that's coming out from me. And I would really appreciate you checking that out. The other thing is you're probably wondering, wow, dude, where'd you get this sick tea? It's a whole vibe. All right, so this is from Into the AM, and they've been an ongoing supporter of my content. So if you'd like to get some graphic tees, I will also leave a link for that down below. And you can use the coupon code CALEB, which will give you even more off of any sale prices. I generally like my shirts a little bit bigger. This is an extra large, but they have all different sizes and styles. So to start off, I'm going to show you very basic C code. So this percent %s is the format character for string. The backslash n is the new line character. So if you run it like this, you might see this percent sign. And basically that's just saying, hey, we implicitly decided, hey, we're going to move down to the next line for the prompt. But I'm just going to leave that in there just because I think it's a little clearer. All right, cool. So when you define a string, in this case, we're using a string literal, which is when we type out the value in our code. And we're assigning that to a character array. And that is what C strings are. They're actually character arrays. When you do this though, it's going to automatically add another character to the string. So what the string ends up looking like is a, an array of characters where we have C, A, L, E, B, and then another character which is a backslash zero. And this is the null character and it basically says, hey, we're going to end the string here. So the actual size of this array is one, two, three, four, five, six characters. However, this one is not going to be really used for anything. This is just to basically say, hey, we don't have any more characters, so stop reading the string. And that's important for functions. So for example, if we're using printf, it knows when to stop printing the name because it hits that backslash zero or the null character. You might hear it as the null terminator or anything along that line. So when we run this, it knows to stop at B because the next character is the null terminating character. Additionally, we can do things such as print the length of the string. And for this, we will need to change this from a string to an unsigned long, which is actually LU. And when we run this, we first should include string.h. We execute this and we still get the value five. So it does not count the null character in the size of the array. And that's pretty important because even if we declare this to have, let's say, size 20, and we run this, the output is still five. So although we have extra memory reserved, you know, there's more character space beyond this, it still stops at that null character. And you can actually do this manually if you wanted to. And what that's going to look like is you could use curly braces and define each individual character which you might see on occasion, but it's generally not recommended unless you have to just because it takes extra time and doesn't really add a lot of value. But just to show you that it works, we can save this and things are going to work the same way. We still get the value five and we should be able to print it out just like we did before. Another thing is instead of the backslash zero, you can also just use the number zero. And to understand why that works is because there's a direct correlation between characters and numbers. And if you look up an ASCII table and look at the one with the decimal value of zero right here, this is actually the null character. It will mean the same exact thing. It gets stored the same way. Now, when you create a string, let's go ahead and actually change this back to the string literal just because I think it's cleaner. You can access each individual character using an index, which by the way, when you remove that number here, that's still going to give it a size. It just does it implicitly based on the data we provided here. So it's smart enough to realize how big of a, a string we are giving it, which will give it enough space to store that in memory. 
but we can continue to use indexes throughout. So for example, if we wanted to access a specific character, you can say name and then use square brackets, which I'll usually pronounce this of, so name of zero. This is going to give us an individual character. In this case, it's going to be the C character. So to print a character, we're going to use percent %C. And let's go ahead and run this, and we should get a C printed to the terminal, and that's exactly what we get. So let's go ahead and try this with some other numbers. Let's go ahead and do three. That's E, and then four should be B, and then five should be that null character, and we don't see anything here. Now, you don't generally want to be printing that or going beyond that. This is bad, and uh, it's going to generate a warning, but it will let you still run the code. It's just um, what exactly happens is undefined. You know, if you're trying to access some area of memory where you're not supposed to be, it might crash the program. And also I wanted to mention array index six is past the end of the array, which contains six elements. So the compiler here does take note that there is an element of the null character because we have one, two, three, four, five, and then an implicit null at the end of this. So those are the basics so far, and even if you're working with the string class in C++, it's going to be using these C style strings behind the scenes. Right now we've been working with string literals where we type out the value, but now I want to talk about how we can get input from the user. So in this situation, let's just go ahead and print the entire name, but we're not going to be able to type the value here, so what do we do? Well, instead of typing the value, we just give it a size. What size do we give it? Uh, typically, I would just recommend giving it whatever size seems reasonable for whatever you're doing. So how long would a name be? Ah, uh, there's some probably pretty long names out there, but let's just go with 30 characters. This will give the user up to 29, and that's important, 29 characters to type their name. That last character is reserved for the null character. So we can get 29 characters from the user and they don't have to give all 29 characters, but it'll be up to 29 characters. And you do that with reading a string, so percent %s. And you can put a number here, such as 29, to say only get the first 29 characters, which is really convenient. And we're going to store that in name. Now you don't have to use the address of operator here like you might see because it's a string, which is really just an array. And arrays work automatically for storing data because they decay to pointers. So let's run this code, try it out. It's not asking us to do anything, we didn't give a prompt, but it is waiting for our input. So let's just go ahead and put our name. And there we go. Now, if we wanted to say, store a name up to say five characters, we would put a six, which would give us five characters to type their name. And then the max here we would want is five. So let's just try this out, and I just shortened it so we don't have to type as much. So if I went ahead and said Caleb with a bunch of Bs, when I hit enter, it only grabs the first five of those. If we don't put that five here, we can still put a bunch of characters after. So I'll just go ahead and put a bunch of Bs here, but there's a potential to cause problems because those are going to be stored outside of the bounds of the array, which is essentially overriding other areas of memory. And you can see we get a crash here. So yeah, we always want to be on the safe side and limit the characters. Let's go ahead and put this back to 30. And that'll give us 29 characters to type their name. And we will limit to the first 29 characters. And let's go ahead and print the size of this. So we could say whatever the name is, is percent %lu characters long. And then we could substitute in the length of name as well using sterlen, which we did earlier. But let's just test it out when we are typing our name. So we type in Caleb, and it says Caleb is five characters long. I'll try it again with a really long example where we go over that 29 character limit, and it says Caleb is 29 characters long. So that is the basics of getting input from the user and working with the length of strings. Now I wanna talk about string comparison. For this, we're going to use another function called strcomp string compare. So let's go ahead and try that out. So if you want to check if the thing that they typed in is equal to some value, then what we can do is use an if statement. 
And actually, before we even go into an if statement, let's just use another printf. And you can print a Boolean just using percent %i. So one will be true and zero will be false. So for example, if we went in here and typed true, which we, I believe, will need to import from standard bool.h, if we print this, and um, let's go ahead and ask the user for their name, just to make this program make a little bit more sense. What is, uh, don't scream at him. What is your name? Perfect. All right, so let's run this. What is your name, Caleb? Caleb is five characters long, and we get the value one. So that is the simplest example. But what we can do is we can put a function call to string compare, so strcmp, and pass in two strings in here. The first one being the name character array we've created, and then the value we want to compare it to. Now I wanted to put this in a printf where we're just printing an integer because the output of string compare is not intuitive if you're doing it the first time. It actually gives us zero if they're equal. So if we run this and give it the name Caleb, and we'll make sure the capitalization is the same, we hit enter and we get zero. So if we're talking about one being true and zero being false, this would actually be uh, false. So what you can do is you can actually invert this and then if it's zero, it will now be one. So we type in Caleb and we get one. And if it's anything else, it will be zero. So let's go ahead and put tacos. You can see we get zero. So that is how you can check if they are equal. Another way you'll commonly see is to explicitly check if it's equal to zero. This should work in a similar way because if it's not equal to zero, it'll return false, which is zero. So yeah, it could be a little bit confusing. So if we type in Caleb, we get one, so that's true. And then if we type in something else, we get zero, which is false. So that works the way you would expect too. We're checking to see if it's equal to Caleb. We put in tacos, those are not equal, so we should get zero. Now you might be curious why it works this way, where if they're equal, it's zero. Well, it's actually a technique to see the ordering alphabetically of the different words. So let's replace this printf with an actual if statement, and I'll show you what I mean. So we can say if, and then say string compare, name versus Caleb, or whatever string you want to compare to, checking to see if that's zero. If it's zero, let's go ahead and print your name is Caleb. But what we can do is say else if and do another string compare, this time checking the same thing, name against Caleb being less than zero. And in that situation, if it's a negative, the first string actually comes before this string in the alphabet. So it's gonna go character by character. So if you put the name like Alex or something, this is going to be negative. So let's just test that out real quick. Your name is before Caleb. And I'm going to actually add in some new line characters here just to make the output clearer. And we will test this out real quick. So we'll run this. What is your name? Alex. Alex is four characters long. Your name is before Caleb. Let's do the third case if it's greater than which I guess you could just use an else because that's the only other possibility. Print F, your name comes after Caleb. Let's try this out. John, four characters long, your name comes after Caleb. This goes character by character. So if we try something like Caleb ending in D, this is going to come after Caleb. Basically, it'll get kale, and then it'll realize D comes after B, so it'll end with saying after. Let's try another example of that, where we say kale, uh, but end with an A instead of a B, and it's before Caleb. And lastly, if they're the same, it will say your name is Caleb. Capitalization does matter, so if you say Caleb lowercase, it'll say your name comes after Caleb. Going back to the ASCII table, the capital letters come first. So this is seen as later in the alphabet than this. So that is a bit on string comparison. I have two more functions I wanna talk about in this video, and then you're good to go. So we're gonna talk about concatenation next, and then we'll talk a little bit about string copying. So I'm gonna go ahead and just clear out what we have, and we will just define 
a character array called first name, or actually just first, and we'll give it a size of 12, and I'll explain why here in a second. And I'm going to assign this to string literal Caleb. You could of course still get this from user input, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to hard code it. And then I'm going to make a last name array, and I'll just leave the size to be auto calculated based on this string here. So we have Caleb, and then we have Curry. And I added a space here. And you'll see why here in a minute, but basically we're going to combine these together and we want to have a space between the two names. So that's just an easy way to do that. To concatenate these, we'll say stir cat and then pass in the first name and the last name. And what this will do is it will take the last name and append it to the first name, which is why we gave it the 12 characters. Five here, five here, and then a space, and then the null terminator, which is a total of 12. And I specifically did not leave this empty because then it would have just given six spaces, five and the null character. So I wanted to make sure that we had enough there, which is why I explicitly put a value there. And then we can print first, and it should actually have the full name in there. And actually there's other functions to print strings as well. So I'll show you one of those, put S, and we'll pass in first and run this. And you can see we get the output Caleb Curry, just like we hoped. A better naming for this, you know, you might name this name instead of just first. Or what you could do is actually create a third variable. So I'll show you that as well. But this should work the same. And we still got Caleb Curry. But let's say we had first. And we just let that be defined as is. And then we had a character array called name of size 12. What we could first do is take the first name and put it inside a name. Do this again with just a space, like so, and then do it a final time with the last name. Running this, it's broken. Two problems with this. First, I forgot to remove the space here, and we should initialize this to an empty string. So we run this now and we get Caleb Curry, but we've preserved the first name if you needed to reference that separately. We didn't overwrite that. So that's another way you could do it. Now the last function I wanted to show you is how to copy strings. So we're going to use the string copy function. This is pretty simple. All you have to do is execute stir copy without any vowels here, passing in the destination first, so let's say we wanted to copy our first name into our last name, we would put last name first, and then where we wanted to get that data from. So running this now, and you can see we get Caleb Caleb. So it took the value from first and put that into the destination last, overriding curry. This is a very valuable tool when we want to put a string literal into an already initialized array. For example, if we wanted to reassign last to the name Caleb, you might try to do this. Last is Caleb. Well, this is going to cause a compilation error. Expression must be a modifiable L value. Basically saying this left value needs to be modifiable and these character arrays are, are not. So the alternative way of doing this would be to replace it character by character, which would be a massive pain, or just using the string copy with whatever value you wanted to use. So you could actually hard code a string literal here and it will work the same way. This is super, super handy and definitely a function you want to memorize. This is valuable not only if you want to replace a string, but if you define a string at some point in the past, let's just say this is size six, but you don't know what the value is going to be yet. So you just define the array and you want to assign a value to it later, that's exactly how you can do it with string copy. And in theory, this should work the same way. Perfect. And obviously in this case, maybe I'll just change that value to curry. That makes a little bit more sense. All right, but hopefully by the end of this video, you now have my name memorized since we use it for every single example. Sorry, I'm just a little, you know, self-absorbed, which if you want to support that, then be sure to subscribe to this channel let that number get to my head. We're going for a million. Let's get there. We'll get there someday, hopefully. That's all I got for this video. The next video, what we're going to be doing is the same thing, but with the string class in C++. If you're working with C++, 
you now have a good understanding of the C style strings. Now you're going to appreciate using that string class much more because it abstracts away a lot of this and it's really handy. So whether you're studying C or C++, I encourage you to try that video out and get some practice with the string class in C++. That should be out here in a few days. So be sure to subscribe if you're just seeing this when it was out. And if this came out in the past, then be sure to check out my channel for all kinds of C and C++ videos. And of course, check out the link to the newsletter. That's where you're going to get updates on all new content coming out on my channel, my course platform, or other channels that I contribute to, which I do on occasion, such as Free Code Camp. So check out that newsletter link as well. Thank you so much for watching. Peace out. I'll see you in the next one.